When people think of Hanna-Barbera, they usually think of Scooby-Doo, the Flintstones, the Jetsons, Yogi Bear, stuff like that. The general public doesn't know any of their other shows. I mean, go ask someone in public about, I don't know, Goober and the Ghost Chasers and see what kind of reaction you get. But ever since Jellystone came out, I have been utterly obsessed with the ins and outs of Hanna-Barbera and know a lot about their deep cuts. One that has interested me a lot is The Impossibles. The Impossibles was made during Hanna-Barbera's Hanna little era of action cartoons, and in a way represents a mix of, of their action shows and their goofy comedy shows. You can expect a good mix of action and dialogue filled with puns and wordplay. Splendid! We'll put him somewhere where he can rest in peace. Correction, Big D! You mean rest in pieces! <laughs> <laughs> the characters were designed by Ed Benedict, and this is the last show that he designed for Hanna-Barbera. Ed, Be Ed Benedict is responsible for the goofy, scrimble, bimble Hanna-Barbera character designs. You can thank the likes of Alex Toth and Iwo Takamoto for the more detailed designs seen in the, in the other action shows, and the mystery-solving shows, respectively. The Impossibles premiered on September 10th, 1966 on CBS alongside Frankenstein Jr., which was basically Hanna-Barbera's version of Gigantor. Despite Frankenstein Jr. getting top billing, The Impossibles got two shorts per episode and they take up most of the theme song. The premise of the show is that the three members of a rock and roll boy band are secretly superheroes who help fight crime. There was Coil Man, also known as Coily, Fluid Man, also known as Fluey, and Multi Man, also known as Multi. They were very obviously inspired by the Beatles. Well, with their mod boy band aesthetic. The Impossibles was not only a spoof of the Beatles type rock and roll band, but a spoof of superheroes as well. Other studios were doing them at the same time, so it sort of was an explosion of these sort of superhero spoofs. Bill and Joe uh, were always very, uh, very adept in, in, in what was happening in pop culture. And they very much enjoyed lampooning what was happening in modern times. And, you know, like everybody said that, you know, Huckleberry Hound was inspired by Andy Griffith, and uh, the Flintstones was inspired by the Honeymooners. And, and things like Frankenstein Jr. and all was part of the youth culture that was just beginning to emerge in the mid to late 60s. Although, their musical song reminds me more of the Beach Boys. This concept art shows that the team was originally named The Incredibles, which was later used for, well, you know. Also, Fluid Man was going to have a blue wetsuit instead of his yellowish-green one, and Multi Man wasn't going to have his iconic eye-covering bangs. There were also plans to release a soundtrack album featuring the song sung by The Impossibles, and there was a test pressing featuring Hey You and She Couldn't Dance. However, there was never a complete album release because the Hanna-Barbera Records label shut down. Interestingly enough, Hey You appears in the beginning of four episodes. The Sinister Speck, Pharaoh the Phoenix Fiddler, The Terrible Twister, and The Not-So-Nice Mysterious. She Couldn't Dance appeared in Mother Gruesome, The Wretched Professor Stretch, and The Bizarre Badger. Seems like the other songs were intended for a release, but they never got one. That really sucks because what little we hear of those songs are quite groovy. As we come to the close of the, the songs were sung by the Hanna Barbera singers, and were cut by the same cloth as the layouts from the Flintstones, who bear a striking resemblance to Multi Man. Each story was written by Michael Maltese, who is best known for making the Looney Tunes cartoon What's Opera Duck. Each story is also named after the villain featured in the episode. Each episode begins with the Impossibles performing in concert to their adoring fan club. Then, Coil Man gets a call on his guitar phone thing from the boss, Big D, about a villain causing mayhem so they just up and transform from the singing Impossibles into the superhero Impossibles in front of everyone as they cry, Rally Ho! They each use their superpowers to save the day. Coil Man has a spring coil instead of legs, Fluid Man can turn into fluid, 
and multi man can clone himself. After multiple attempts, they defeat the villain and go back to performing in concert. Not once does someone suspect their secret identity, since they're not so secret in the first place. Heck, in Timetron, the gang gives out their autographs as Coil, Fluey, and Multi. Speaking of which, their reaction to their fans can vary from episode to episode. In the Dashedly Diamond Dazzler, they run away from their fans. In the beginning of the episode, we see the girls listening to their dance 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 song, and referring to it as a new song, but it had already been performed in previous episodes. My headcanon is that the episode takes place when the Impossibles were a relatively new band, and thus were shy of their fans. Episodes like Time Aetron take place after that, and they are more confident around their fans. Funnily enough, both episodes have the dance 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 song. When you hear that beat, gotta move your feet, get up in the groove, gotta shake and move and dance, 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 dance. Listen, girl, the Impossible's new hit song! Get up in the Another weird piece of Impossible's lore is that they're apparently teenagers, according to the episode Professor Stretch Bounces Back. Gee, what an honor for three teenagers! I don't buy this at all because, one, their bases, the Beatles and the Beach Boys, were not teenagers. Two, they go everywhere by themselves without adult supervision, unless you count Big D, I guess, and they can drive. Three, they never go to school. Four. They don't look much like teenagers either. Coily once had a reign of 5 o'clock shadow and the terrible twister. This was an animation error, but it goes to show that even the artists interpreted them as adults. Plus, they don't look very teen-like when you compare them to other teenage Hanna-Barbera characters. 5. Why were they allowed to break a champagne glass? If they're teenagers, then they're not old enough to even drink! Yeah, I'm gonna chop this up to a continuity error. We don't know how or why the Impossibles got their powers, just that they do. It's not just them that have bizarre gimmicks, each villain has their own gimmick too, such as Bubbles. But each thing they have in common is that they say- Those Impossibles are impossible! Those Impossibles are impossible! Okay. Most of the villains only appear once, but there are three of them that have appeared more than once. The Spinner, the infamous Paper Doll Man, and Professor Stretch. This proves that there's at least some continuity. Also, there's a narrator. While in another part of Washington, a top secret is being delivered to a top secret headquarters. He is voiced by Paul Freese, who also voices Fluid Man and Big D. Coil Man is voiced by Hal Smith, and Multi Man is voiced by Don Messick. One of the strongest aspects of the show was definitely in his sound design, from the sound effects to the voice acting to the soundtrack. It all sounds so wonderful. Paul Freese definitely gets to show off his voice acting chops here. He carries a good portion of the show and manages to make all his voices sound distinct from each other. Oh, it's Big D. Sorry to strike a sour note, boys, but our old friend, the scheming Sprayosol, just made off with a top secret secret government secret. And rising to the occasion, our three mop top teen toppers become our three keen top prime stoppers. Going back to the narrator, the scheming Sprayosol actually acknowledges his existence once. Following the armored car is Sprayosol, the most diabolical of all villains. You are so right, Mr. Narrator. And like I said, these villains are very gimmicky and very cheesy. Then again, what are you doing watching a Hanna-Barbera show and expecting a deep storyline and villains with tragic backstories? Not every show has to be all deep. The Impossibles is goofy fun in the same way that the 1966 Batman series is. So just enjoy it for what it is, and make sure to go in expecting lots of laughs. Speaking of the 1966 Batman series, Frankenstein Jr. and the Impossibles came out nine months after that show. Hanna-Barbera is well known for cashing in on the latest trend of their show, so it's possible they saw Batman sit and said, Hey, we should make a show like that too. It takes about nine months to make an animated series, so it checks out. Although, I do wish we learned more about Big D. We know nothing about him except that he's the Impossibles dispatcher. Well, in Aquator, we meet his old friend, the Professor, and this allows the Professor to know who the Impossibles really are. But other than that, not much. You don't even know why he's called Big D. Unless it's because, you know. Get out, everybody! Hand Barbera cartoons are notorious for being cheap, for using the same backgrounds and animations, and they really do 
reuse the same singing and guitar playing animations over and over. My favorite animation error has to be in The Artful Archer, where Fluey and Multi briefly switch hair colors for absolutely no damn reason. Another hilarious error is this moment in The Return of the Perilous Paper Man. That could only mean the return of The Perilous Paper Man! The Perilous Paper Man! <laughs> They forgot to animate Multi's mouth so Fluey suddenly gains Multi's voice. But for what it's worth, the animation is a bit more lively than the typical Hanna-Barbera production. It's actually quite nice to look at sometimes. In Fear of the Fiendish Fiddler, there's a brief scene with lighting and shading. Probably the first time anyone at Hanna-Barbera ever tried lighting and or shading until like the 80s. Plus, the designs go so hard, all of them, especially for the villains. And the backgrounds are gorgeous and colorful. I wouldn't be surprised if this show influenced the Powerpuff Girls. I mean, they have the exact same color scheme and everything. Unlike certain Hanna-Barbera shows, <clears throat> The Impossible doesn't have that much offensive or outdated content. However, there are a few suspicious moments. In the very first episode, there's a young Shah, which is a type of Iranian emperor. He hails from the kingdom of, wait for it, shish kebab. You know, a Middle Eastern food? What the hell, Hanna-Barbera? That's like if I made a French character from a place called Arc du Croissant or something like that. In the devilish dragster, Shish Kebab returns and an older Shah appears complaining that his car was stolen that there will be terrible international consequences. Yeesh. Unless my terribly expensive car is found, there will be terribly serious international complications. Plus, in Television Tron, Coil Man gets transported to Africa, which is portrayed as a stereotypical jungle. Why? Just why? Another offensive episode is the Dastardly Diamond Dazzler, in which the, the Diamond Dazzler himself is a Sikh stereotype. I say he's Sikh because of his turban. The most offensive episode by far is the Rascally Ringmaster, which has a stereotypical Native American using a stereotypical war cry and trying to shoot the impossibles. And in Billy the Kidder, Billy summons a, a crew of cacti that also behave like stereotypical natives. Again. What the hell, Hanna-Barbera? This wasn't okay then, and it's definitely not okay today. Another negative of the show is the character tendency to state the obvious right out loud. This ties into the low-budget animation. The stories had to be carried by dialogue to make up for the less-than-perfect animation, but sometimes it hinders the stories more than it helps them. I'll have to get another cash register. This one is full. I'll help you out, buddy. Put the money in this bag. Holy zoology! I'm being robbed by a talking giraffe! Dude, we can all see you're being robbed by a giraffe. I think the executives thought that kids were stupid and needed everything to be spelled out for them because they wouldn't understand otherwise. There is no doubt that Fluid Man is so overpowered. He can turn into fluid, obviously, and that means he can easily sneak into the villain's lair and even turn into a ring clown. And of course, he's stronger than fire, most of the time anyway. Of course, he does have his weaknesses that are inherent of being made of liquid. In The Wretched Professor Stretch, he is shown getting soaked up by a sponge. In The Devil's Dragster in the Not So Nice Mr. Ice, he gets turned into an ice cube. He gets frozen in the scheming spray assault and the fiendish Dr. Futuro. And he gets evaporated by the puzzler, so he can't always beat fire. In second place is Multi Man. He, he can create duplicates of himself for extra manpower, but his biggest strength is his brains. He can easily trick people with his clones, who are easily expendable, and the villains never manage to capture the original Multi Man. I have destroyed Ooh. all the Multi Men! All but one, Professor! The original! Ouch! Plus, he can repel bullets with his bare hands. If that's not badass, I don't know what is. Another thing of note is that if he grabs something, then duplicates himself, then his duplicates are also holding the same thing. Kylo Man is the least powerful of the party, but he's not to be underestimated. Besides using his spring coil to leap to great heights, he can also drill a hole into doors. In the Paper Doll Man episode, he has shown to be able to turn himself into a clothes hanger, suggesting that his body is completely made of metal. Perhaps because of this, he has enhanced durability. He just took a fall on the safe to the head like it was no big deal. He can either function like a magnet and conduct heat and electricity with his coils, 
In Diabolical Dauber, he uses feel like a magnet to balance the saucer up and down like a yellow. Speaking of magnets, he himself is easily susceptible to the pull of magnets, and the Diamond Dazzler exploits this in his episode. Now, moving on to the villains. The Bubbler can make some pretty sturdy bubbles with his gun, but they are still capable of being cracked with the right amount of strength. The Spinner is a spider-like villain who can shoot bubbles with a gun, but they don't really do much. He's clearly not a very powerful villain. He returns in the episode with the return of the spinner, and he somehow becomes more effective. He puts coil and fluid into spider webs that they can't get out of. So did he get more powerful, or did the impossibles get weaker? The world may never know. The infamous paper doll man is the most famous villain in the show, and for good reason. He is similar to Fluid Man in that he can easily change his form, but he's not very smart. He seriously considered stapling water to the wall, but to make up for it, his design goes so hard. Also, he's very infamous. He comes back in The Return of the Perilous Paper Man, and he's much smarter now, coming up with ways to best each of the impossibles and places of weaknesses. Beamatron can shoot laser beams, but is liable to run out of power quickly. The Burrower is unique in that he has a sidekick, which not many of other villains have. And, as with all evil sidekicks, he's incredibly dumb. Burrow the Burrower's primarily underground burrowing action also makes him a master at the element of surprise. Timetron is at least smart enough to build a time machine and bring some of history's villains into the present, but he hasn't do all the work for him, such as Goliath, Jesse James, and Captain Kidd. Speaking of Timetron, the end of his episode is legitimately terrifying. The Impossible destroys his time machine and he ends up in the past working for Alexander the Great, with no way to escape. That's cold. Smogula. This is where things get dark. He completely upstages all the other previous villains I talked about up to this point. He can control all sorts of weather, and he easily freezes the Impossibles. In fact, he's so powerful that he shook up the usual episode formula. The Impossibles themselves don't even transform until like 4 minutes into the episode. The Sinister Speck is noted having a bizarre modest operandi. He wants to steal the plans of an aircraft and send it to an unfriendly power, which considering this is the 60s, is probably the Soviet Union. Pharaoh the Fiendish Fiddler is another incredibly powerful villain, as all he has to do is play music to send other people into another place. Mother Gruesome Our first woman villain is like Timotron in that she summons other people to do all the work for her. In this case, it's fairy tale characters. Televisitron, much like Pharaoh, can send people to alternate dimensions. In this case, he sends people to different TV shows and movies with varying degrees of danger. Heck, he sent Multiman to a World War I movie! The diabolical Dauber can make anything he paints jump out of the canvas, thus exercising more creative freedom than Mother Gruesome. Aquator stole the professor's secret formula to reduce himself in size, and he rounds up Amoebas to help him take over the Earth, making him another stealthy villain. Thus, for the Impossibles to beat him, they have to shrink down the microscopic size. Interestingly enough, Fluid Man has reservations about shrinking that small. Dude, you are literally OP and made of fluid. You can easily shrink down. I'm not sure if this is a contradiction or a limitation set so that fluid wouldn't be too overpowered. Then again, I'm wondering how he eats and breathes and other science facts. To yourself, it's just the show. I should really just relax. Aquator is also called the Water Wizard. <laughs> I wonder if he'd be friends with Lapis Lazuli, the Water Witch. The Wretched Professor Stretch. I should mention that he's one of the few villains that has the powers directly come from himself. Most of the other villains use tools for their villainy, but Stretch's powers come directly from him. He planned on selling an army tank to an enemy group called Snap, Secret Nasty Association of Putters. As you can tell, his bread and butter is rubber. Just as Aquator was a challenge for Fluid Man, Professor Stretch is a challenge for Coil Man. Coil Man tries to drill a hole through his door but gets bounced away because it's rubber. But of course, all it takes to defeat Stretch is a single finger poke and poof, he's deflated. He returned in Professor Stretch Bounce's back, where he cleverly uses his resources to escape from prison. The Devilish Dragster is, well, a dragster. He's another challenge for the Impossibles. Like I said, he freezes Fluid Man, and his car is also pretty damn cool. It has a drill and everything. The Puzzler. Now we get to the best, 
in my personal favorite villain and episode in the series. First off, he seems to be modeled after the Riddler, who is already one of the best Batman villains. Oh, and he's yet another villain who wants to send things to an evil foreign power or whatever. Anyways, he's one of the few villains that actually has a backstory, and a pretty gruesome one. He fell into a jigsaw machine. The day I fell into that jigsaw machine was the greatest thing that happened to me! <laughs> Yikes. That said, his powers are creepy and cool. He can make himself into any object, and he's totally OP. He compresses Coil Man, gives Multi Man zero room to clone himself, and evaporates Fluid Man. Next up, we have the Satanic Surfer. Yes, really. They got away with calling someone Satanic on a Saturday morning cartoon in 1966. No, he's not actually associated with Satan. They meant Satanic as in extremely evil. Anyway, despite being a surfer, most of his power comes from his ukulele, which he can use to manipulate sea animals. He doesn't really stand a chance against Vera, though, and his ukulele can be used against him. The Scheming Spray Saw has a helmet that sprays liquid or gas. He also has a lisp, which makes him pretty charming. <laughs> the laugh's on you, fellas! I'll take that briefcase! He proves to be a formidable f foe to Fluey, freezing him instantly. That said, Fluey beats him easily. The Scurrilous Sculptor is shown turning people into cement statues, but the Impossibles easily break him out of it. And of course, he gets defeated in an ironic way as he gets turned into a statue himself. The Artful Archer doesn't have any powers, so his villainy relies solely on his archery skills, of which they are proficient and creative. Interestingly enough, he's one of the three villains to get redeemed. Towards the end of the episode, he becomes a musician while in county jail, and the Impossibles even show him to play music with him. I think a lot of the villains have the capacity to put their skills to go good use, but they waste it on selling information to an evil foreign power or whatever. The Insidious Inflator? Oh shit, DeviantArt's gonna love this episode. Luckily, despite the title, it's not what you think. The Inflator uses his gun thing to make parade balloons come to life to do his evil bidding. Despite manipulating balloons, the Inflator can use his gun to create strong forces of wind. And just like the Archer, the Inflator turned to the side of good by selling balloons to children. Now that's what I'd call the greatest redemption arc in the history of fiction. Eat your heart out, Zuko. The Dastardly Diamond Dazzler. I don't know, he's too much of an ethics stereotype for me to enjoy or properly, properly rate. He relies entirely on his rings and that's it. Cornelia Critch, the Tricky Witch. The second and last woman villain. In her episode, she explicitly states that she steals from the rich and gives to the poor, and by the poor she means herself. As for her powers, her broomstick is powered by the moon. I guess this means that she is most effective at night. But then again, moonlight is just sunlight reflected on the moon. Oh, why am I looking too deep into a children's show? She has a bunch of unique tricks up her sleeve, and because of that, I like her much more than Mother Gruesome. The Terrible Twister is such a good episode, and character. The Terrible Twister is an evil British person who is an absolute delight. And the usual narrator is replaced with a snarky British narrator. The Yankee group called the Impossibles go into action. Then suddenly become the Invincible Impossibles, secret fighters, defenders, and champions for justice, and all that. That said, the Turbo Twister is basically powerless without his propeller. The Terrifying Tappers taps into telephone lines to rob people. He's like Televisitron in that he uses technology to send people to different places. He even manages to best Multiman, including the original. Not for long, obviously, as he easily gets trapped by Coilman and confined to a prison telephone system. The Anxious Angler. Okay, so this guy's motive is that he wants to steal secret space plans and show them to an unfriendly foreign power. Do you know what was going on at the time this episode aired? That's right, the space race between the United States and the USSR. If this isn't definite proof that at least some of the villains are working for the Soviet Union, or at least a parody of the Soviet Union, I don't know what is. However, the unfriendly foreign power is a made-up country called Lower Larsenia. Anyways, he's an anglerfish-themed villain who's thought of everything. Just when the Apostles come with their submarine, he brings out his anti-sub gun. 
He also has a magnet that can take what's real and what's fake, which he uses to expose which multi-man is the original. The rascally ringmaster has to be one of the most violent villains yet. He uses his clowns to shoot people with loaded 45s. Bingo. Speaking of which, the ringmaster uses circus acts to do his bidding for him, like the human torch and the human rubber band. Billy the Kidder is a futuristic western outlaw who rides a robotic horse thing. He has a cool lunar lasso, remote control tumbleweeds, and an army of robotic cows. He is the final villain to be redeemed, and he joins a rodeo where he gets tossed around violently by real horses. The Phoenix Futuro is a villain from the 40th century. He's definitely more interesting than Timatron, because he actually does the work himself. He's also one of the few villains smart enough to try and knock out the original multi-man. Instead of just his clones, he turns him into an old man. The Crafty Clutcher is another stealthy villain. He sneaks up on people when they least expect it, much like the Burrower. In this case, he uses floating hands to seal stuff. He also uses a remote control shoes, which backfire when fully puts his feet in them. The infamous Mr. Instant can make anything he wants. All he has to do is dial in on his gun, and he gets a bundle of dynamite, a door, anything. He might be the most OP villain yet. All you have to do to defeat him is take his gun and dial the combination for an instant prison cell. The Bizarre Batter is a baseball-themed villain who uses a control panel to determine the outcome of a baseball game. He kidnaps the star player and demands $1 million for ransom. As with all the villains, he gets defeated by having his gimmick turn against him, and he's out in three strikes. Finally, the not-so-nice Mr. Ice. As you can tell, he relies entirely on freezing things. He's the most ruthless villain. He exploits Fluvi's liquid nature by freezing him into a block of ice and shredding that block into pieces. Don't worry, Fluvi gets better. And that is every single villain in the series. They started off weak, but ended off strong by thinking of clever ways to match the impossibles and play to each of their weaknesses. Here are, in my opinion, the best villains and, by extension, episodes. Frankenstein Jr. and the Impossibles only lasted 18 episodes. Moral Guardians complained about violence in children's television, and they got it cancelled. I can't speak on the violence in Frankenstein Jr. since I haven't watched it, but I can attest that the Impossibles is indeed quite violent. Unlike Batman, which censored the punches with hit flashes, the Impossible shows the punches right on screen. Also, there are many instances of guns. Despite this, the show is actually quite successful in the ratings and such. It, along with Space Ghost, kickstarted an era of Saturday morning superhero cartoons. Hanna-Barbera later recycled the entire concept of the Impossibles for 1979's The Super Globe Trotters. Spaghetti Man was based on Coil Man, Liquid Man was based on Fluid Man, it even had an F instead of an L, and Multi Man was based on... well, guess. I know Hanna-Barbera wrote themselves off a lot, but this is ridiculous. It received a single comic issue by Gold Key Comics in 1966, which is later recycled for the Impossibles UK Annual. In 1996, the Impossibles and Frankenstein Jr. had a crossover in issue 8 of Hanna-Barbera Presents in Archie Comics. First, there was an Impossible solo story where they fought a villain named Feedback. In the crossover, Frankenstein Jr. gets brainwashed by aliens to become evil, so Buzz Conroy hacks into Coe's guitar neck to call the Impossibles, instead of Big D for once. In the end, Frankenstein Jr. is reset back to normal, and he and Buzz enjoy an Impossibles concert. It is important to note that around this time, Hanna-Barbera cartoons were actively being rewritten on Cartoon Network, including Frankenstein Jr. and the Impossibles, and this comic was a good, na- good way to breathe new life into these properties. Decades later, the Impossibles appeared in issue 43 of Scooby-Doo Team Up, also alongside Frankenstein Jr. However, the story is a complete copy of the 1996 story. Once again, Frankenstein Jr. turns evil and the Impossibles have to turn him back to normal. Speaking of Scooby-Doo, in the direct-to-DVD movie Mask of the Blue Falcon, there are people cosplaying the Impossibles and also a poster of them in the background. In Scoop, there are trick or treaters dressed as the Impossibles and Shaggy has a poster of the band in his room. In the mid to late 2010s, DC Comics had a line of comics called Hanna-Barbera Beyond, which were edgier versions of Hanna-Barbera shows. Among these was Future Quest, which was a massive crossover amongst most of Hanna-Barbera's action cartoons, including The Impossibles. In this series, they have a backstory. They are stories on a cheesy children's TV show produced by HB that functions exactly like the 1966 cartoon. 
They then got exposed to a special radiation from FEAR, a terrorist organization. In this continuity, Big D is a woman named Deva Sumati. The trio are also joined by a girl named Esme Santos, who has control over magnetic fields and calls herself Cobalt Blue. The last thing I want to know is that while The Impossibles isn't that big in America, it's humongous in Japan. There, it was called Super 3 and given its own custom theme song. ラリホ、ラリホ、ラリルレロン。ラリホ、ラリホ、ラリルレロン。ウィルは手ぶっちょぶよよよよ。ウィルは手ぶっちょぶよよよよ。ウィルは手ぶっちょぶよよよよ。